We live in a world that's perpetually on edge. With economic instability, conflicting political leanings, and the rise of a woke generation, the church itself also faces challenges unprecedented, with biblical illiteracy, painful division, and spiritual disconnection. As followers of Christ, to respond to these challenges is to ground ourselves in the truth and the word of God himself. Let his grace carry you through and let no wave in this broken world drown you out. Be equipped at Intentional Discipleship Conference 2023. Anchored. Standing true against the tide. January 26, 28, 2023. Live at the CCF Center. Our workshops are crafted to help you navigate the wind and waves of the spiritual journey. May it be in thriving to serve God through your business, in understanding the new generation biblically, in rediscovering house fellowships, in being united as a church, in discipling your family in the digital age, or in starting your discipleship journey. Buy your tickets now. Early bird rates end on December 31, so visit the IDC booth at the ground floor lobby and visit idc.org.ph to know more about the workshops.
always with us. And Lord, even as we look towards the end of this year, 2022,
amazing love we have from our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, can we just pause and reflect for a moment? Just think about how the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords gave up His life for us. He died for our sins that we may experience forgiveness and be reconciled with Him forever. What a gracious God we have. A God who is loving. A God who is merciful. And a God who deserves all our praise and all our worship. Can we applaud our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ? He deserves all the glory and praise. You know, as we just lifted our voices, worshiping our gracious and loving God, now let us join our hearts and worship as we read God's Word. Let us remember that we are before the holy presence of God. Today, we will be reading from Romans chapter 15, verses 14 to 28, and then we will proceed to Romans chapter 16, verse 25 to 27. Let us all read together. Five, chapter 15, verse 14, And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to also admonish one another. But I have written very boldly to you on some points so as to remind you again because of the grace that was given me from God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jer Jerusalem and round about as far as Illy Illyricum, I fully preach the gospel of Christ. And thus I aspire to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, they who had no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. For this reason... I have often been prevented from coming to you. But now, with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you when I first enjoyed your company for a while. But now I am going to Jerusalem serving the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do so, and they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. Therefore, when I have finished this and have put my seal on this fruit of theirs, I will go on by way of you to Spain. Let's move to chapter 16, verse 25. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested. And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of His Word. You may now take your seats, everyone. Today, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together. But before we do, if you do not have the bread and the juice, can you kindly raise your hand so that our ushers can approach you? Again, for those who do not have the juice and the bread, kindly raise your hands so that our ushers can approach you. As we begin celebrating the Lord's Supper, we will read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 29. And this is what it says. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, we celebrate the Lord's Supper as an act of worship and thanksgiving. And as, was, as, as we have read, Jesus thanked God for the bread, which symbolizes his body, and for the wine, which symbolizes his blood. And when we partake the Lord's Supper, we do so with thanksgiving in our hearts. For Jesus' sacrifice, he gave himself up for us to die, and he shed his blood for the atonement of our sins. And through his sacrifice, we can now live the full life he promised, filled with hope, assured that one day we will live in eternity with Christ Jesus. So when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we publicly declare his death, his resurrection, and his second coming. And we do so with gratitude and reverence. You know, the next verses of chapter 11 reads, Therefore, who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the, blood, of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. At this time, I'd like to ask all of us to pause and reflect. Let us ask God to examine our hearts and ask for forgiveness if there be any sin in our lives. Let us pause. If you are not yet sure about being a follower of Christ, you may refrain from partaking of the bread and the juice. And if you want to know more about Jesus, we would like to invite you to our welcome center so that we can share the gospel with you. And you can proceed to the welcome center right after this worship service. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, with all our hearts, we thank you for your sacrifice that paid for our sins for your body and blood which have been given for our salvation. Lord, we remember and honor you, our Lord and our Savior. Let us all together partake of the bread. Let us all partake of the juice. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your great love, for your grace in our lives. Thank you for giving your Son, Jesus Christ, for dying on the cross to pay for the penalty of our sin. Thank you, Lord, for the grace to respond in faith to the gospel of your salvation. 
And we thank you, dear God, that in Christ, we can now live new lives in you. We can live victorious over sin. And we can live in hope that one day, we will spend all eternity with you in heaven. Thank you for your great love, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just before we start with our worship service, as we hear the message, I'd like to share with you a very important announcement. We are happy to inform you that the Intentional Discipleship Conference 2023 is now fully on site after three years. And so we want you to get to experience the best of this annual event as you listen to our international speakers live. And um, we would like to invite you to uh, choose from the seven relevant workshops you can join face-to-face -face as we all get to share and interact with other participants. Now to know more about the IDC, let's watch this video. We live in a world that's perpetually on edge. With economic instability, conflicting political leanings, and the rise of a woke generation. The church itself also faces challenges unprecedented with biblical illiteracy, painful division, and spiritual disconnection. As followers of Christ, to respond to these challenges is to ground ourselves in the truth and the word of God himself. Let his grace carry you through and let no wave in this broken world drown you out. Be equipped at Intentional Discipleship Conference 2023, anchored, Standing true against the tide, January 26, 28, 2023, live at the CCF Center. Our workshops are crafted to help you navigate the wind and waves of the spiritual journey. May it be in thriving to serve God through your business, in understanding the new generation biblically, in rediscovering house fellowships, in being united as a church, in discipling your family in the digital age, or in starting your discipleship journey. Buy your tickets now. Early bird rates end on December 31. So visit the IDC booth at the ground floor lobby and visit idc.org.ph to know more about the workshops. There you have it. There you have it. Save the day, January 26 to 28. We hope to see you there face to face. And as the video mentioned, tickets are available at the ground floor lobby here at the CCF Main Center. So please get your tickets now. And for more information, visit our website, idc.org.ph. Now as we begin, why don't we just pray for our time together and pray for our speaker, Pastor Ricky. Let us pray. Dear God, Heavenly Father, we once again thank you so much for the privilege of worshiping you today. Lord, we just lift up our whole worship service to you. May you use this to speak to us, Lord. Would you convict us, dear God? Would you speak to each one of us, Lord? We pray for Pastor Ricky. Lord, that you would use him to deliver, to deliver your message and your truth. I pray, dear God, that you would just allow him to be fully dependent on your Holy Spirit as he delivers your message today. And we pray, dear God, for all of us, Lord, that you would move, remove any distraction, anything that would hinder us from fully appreciating and understanding your word today. I pray, dear God, that we would not just be listeners of your word, but we would be doers of it. Help us, Holy Spirit, to live out your truths in our lives. Father, we thank you for today. We worship you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's welcome Pastor Ricky. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the first Sunday of December. Hallelujah. My God is the God of time. And once upon a time, he stepped out of time into history. And here we all are because he did that. Well, folks, uh, just a follow-up word on IDC. Remember, the early bird rates up to the end of December 
Make sure you catch the early bird rate because if you don't make early bird, you will become the? The angry bird. Amazing, you still remember after the whole, you know, three years of being in a pandemic, you still remember that principle. Don't be the angry bird, be the early bird. Uh, in this, our last season of this amazing book of Romans, we've been talking about living the full life. And it's a life that Jesus intends for each and every person who comes to faith in Him. But you know, even if this doesn't mean that we will all be gazillionaires, maybe some of us will, I don't know. If, you, if that happens to you, remember us. But it means, well, let's put it this way. This full life, if, if it were a picture, what would it look like? Uh, w w is there a pattern that you and I can, can observe and at least say, you know, if, if, I, if I pattern my life after this, I will know that I am living the full life that Jesus intends for me. So that's, that's why this message today is so important for all of us. We'll be looking at the remainder of chapter 15 and quite a bit of the 16th as well. We won't look at each and every verse, but it, it will show us actually very clearly from God's Word that the full life has a picture, and we need to pattern our lives after what that picture looks like. But before we go there, do you, do you recall this, um, this saying, a picture is worth a thousand words? How many of you remember that? You're familiar with that? We're not exactly sure who actually invented that, uh, that sentence. Maybe his name is Anonymous, you know, like many of these famous sayings are attributed to Anonymous. But, but it's true. And so we ask ourselves, uh, if we were to put the, the full life into a picture, what, what would it look like? Because we indeed we agree that a picture paints a thousand words. By the way, do, do you remember that old song? Let, let's see who's part of my generation. Uh, do you remember that song? There could never be a portrait. Wow, you all remember that? Pastor Marty, we need to evangelize more youth because the generation... No, no, I know your secret. I know why you know that song. Your parents taught you that. Or maybe your grandparents, right? Or maybe, maybe you're like from more, uh, 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 maybe my generation. Remember that song? Uh, if a picture paints a thousand words. <laughs> Grave. Amazing. Praise God for all of you. You see, songs have been written about this whole idea. So let me, let me give an example of a picture. And then I want you to tell the person next to you what words enter your mind. Is that okay? Well, let me show you a picture. Here you go. Look at this picture. So tell the person next to you what words come into your mind when you see this picture. Okay, so words like aw, it's aw a word. Oh, cute, innocence, discovery, curiosity. What about giggle? Anybody have like giggle I mean, in the words, you know? By the way, this is a picture of my youngest grandchild. Yeah, she, oh, now you're saying, oh, see, she's, yeah, she's two. So like I'm saying, you know, some pictures can leave you speechless, but really, in your mind, um, words are, are, are playing out, right? And so today, we're going to talk about this. A picture of the full life. What does it look like? And how can we pattern our lives after that by the grace of God? And so, like I said, um, in, in the remainder of chapter 15, as we look at the life of the Apostle Paul, we'll realize that uh, there is a picture of this full life. But you know what? More than that, I'll tell you this. The entire book of Romans, the entire book is actually a picture of the full life. What do I mean? Remember, we've been looking at this, uh, this, this pattern or this, uh, this breakdown of the book of Romans. This is actually, the entire thing is a picture of the full life. We begin as we realize what our problem is, and our biggest problem is sin. And God opens our spiritual eyes, and we realize we need to be saved. We cannot save ourselves. The gospel becomes real. We embrace Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And so we are made righteous. The, the perfect and holy righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed into our empty bankrupt spiritual bank account. 
That's what happens. And then the full life begins to blossom. Sanctification, where do we get the power to live righteously? The Holy Spirit takes up, takes up residence in our lives, and we begin to realize that living by His power, we are able to live a life of obedience that pleases God. And then Paul kind of seemed to have taken a detour in chapters 9 to 11 when he uh, put up Israel as like exhibit A of the sovereignty of God. But it's not a detour because we realize the reason why you and I are here is precisely because of God's sovereign plan that when the gospel was preached to the Jews, they rejected it and they rejected Messiah. And so Paul was sent on his original and ultimate mission along with many others to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And that's why you and I are believers today. And finally, in our last season, service. What do we do for the rest of our lives? Well, therefore, because of the mercies of God, we offer up our bodies as a living sacrifice. And we live the rest of our days on earth in service to the God to whom we owe everything. So folks, does that make sense to everyone that the entire book of Romans is a picture of the full life? Amen or amen? Yes. So. The question is this, here is an empty picture frame. This is reserved for your, a picture of your life. So you folks who are in this hall today, special shout out to our friends from CCF North EDSA. All of you who are joining online, this picture frame is reserved for a picture of your life. And if your life were to be translated and placed in the midst of this picture frame, what would it look like? What words would your life elicit? And would they be words that describe the full life? And again, that's why this message is so critical in whatever, uh, I guess, stage we are in our spiritual journey. So as I said earlier, we will be looking at the life of the Apostle Paul. And not all of the details, but he, in the rest of chapter 15, maybe unbeknownst to him as he was writing the rest of the chapter, he's actually giving us a picture of maybe not a comprehensive picture, but a good enough picture of what the full life is like. What are its basic components? And so as we look at the, the, what, what Paul is talking about in the rest of chapter 15, we can say, is that true about my life? Is that the picture of my life? So let's go to uh, our main message today, a picture of the full life. Again, this is not exhaustive, but it is based on the text that we will go through today. And there are at least, at least four components to the picture of the full life. A person living the full life is, first of all, a recipient of God's grace. Second, that person is a minister of God's gospel. Third, the person living the full life is an instrument of God's power. And finally, a person living the full life is a what? A servant of God's people. Again, this, you can add other stuff into this picture, but based on what we will read, these are four components of the picture of the full life based on what the Apostle Paul had written in the remainder of chapter 15. So let's go there together. In verse 14, <clears throat> this is what we read. And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness filled with all knowledge and able to admonish one another. Paul had some very kind and encouraging words to say to the Christians in Rome, whom he had never met at this point. And he's saying, you know, I, I really trust the Lord is doing an amazing work in your life. However, he said in verse 15, but I have written very boldly to you on some points so as to remind you again. So Paul never missed the opportunity to, uh, as we say in CCF, over-communicate some very important things. And uh, in, the, in the chapters that Pastor Peter had just taken us through, you know, this whole idea about uh, unity in the body of Christ and loving one another and 
the, the whole world will know we are disciples of God if we love one another and concentrating on the essentials and having liberty in the non-essentials and so forth. So these things Paul had to uh, really emphasize. But even if he was apparently exercising a great degree of, shall we say, spiritual or even fatherly authority over his, his audience, he said he only does that because of the grace that was given me from God. In other words, he's saying, whatever I am today, whatever I'm doing, whatever it seems I may have accomplished, and even the reason why I'm able to tell you these things and why I love you so much and why my life has come this far, all of it is because of one word. What is that word? Grace. I am a recipient of the grace of God. How do we know that? He said, the grace that was given to me. And you know, Paul never let his audience and he never let himself forget the fact that he's merely a recipient of the grace of God. For example, further back down in Romans chapter 12, he said, for through the grace given, me, given to me, I say to every one among you. In Corinthians, he said, according to the grace of God which was given to me. He never forgot that he is a product of the grace of God. Nothing more, nothing less. And even in, elsewhere in 1 Corinthians, he said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. I labored even more than all of them, you know, the other apostles. And yet, he said, it's not about me. It's but uh, uh, I, not I, but the grace of God with me. So folks, I guess the first question to us today is, is your story, is my story a story of the grace of God? I pray it is. And I know for many of you, you know that's what it is. You know, and as Paul looked back at his life, uh, if you read in Philippians chapter 3, for example, which we won't show, but you can look it up yourself, he talked about his his uh, cultural, social, and religious pedigree, right? He said, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews from the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Pharisee, etc., etc." So when it came to, you know, being a full-blooded Jew, not a convert to Judaism, uh, he was d discipled or raised or educated only by the best in the law of God, and he was zealous, and he really believed that he was doing the right thing when he was persecuting Christians. You know, all, he said all of these things are... Actually, he, he used a very strong word. But the thing is, when he went down that Damascus road and God opened his spiritual eyes, Paul realized his true position in life. And so as he goes back and reviews how he was a recipient of the grace of God, this is what he said in 1 Timothy 1. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, even though, meaning in spite of. Do you know that Christians, do you, do you know the word ISO certified? Have you heard that term? ISO certified. You know Christians are ISO certified because ISO means in spite of. In spite of ourselves, God has extended His grace to us and that's why you and I are here today. So the next time you want to tell your story to somebody else, tell him, Pare, I am ISO certified. Oh? What does that mean? Let me tell you my story. Good opening? Try it someday. So he says, you know, this is what I was. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And read this with me. The grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. You know, as Paul was recollecting what he used to be like. You know, these are serious things. Blasphemer means a reverser of, of spiritual truth. Basically, he's telling people, Jesus is not the Messiah. He's not God. A persecutor is one who hunts down. He literally hunted Christians down. And then a violent aggressor means somebody who finds pleasure in causing other people pain. That's the kind of person that Paul was. And that's why he says in uh, the next verses, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom 
I am foremost of all. In other translations, it says, I am the worst. Sometimes I am the chief of sinners. But you know what? As Paul recalls the fact that he's a recipient of, the, of God's grace, he has a sentence of hope. Because he said in verse 16, Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me, as the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. What is verse 16 saying in simple English? In simple English, Paul is saying, if there is hope for me, there is hope for, for you. If God can change me, he can change anybody. Maybe there's someone here this morning and your life is such a mess and you think that you are beyond the reach of the grace of God. Well, my friend, by the grace given me, like Paul is saying, I want to correct your wrong thinking. You are not out of reach of the grace of God. You are not. As a matter of fact, you being here or listening to this message today is part of the work of God's grace in your life. So listen. Open your heart. And by the way, if you know someone who doesn't know Jesus yet, maybe he's a member of your family, I don't know, a good friend, and you think that person is like his life is, or her life is spiraling out of control, uh, out of reach of the grace of God, think again. If God did it for Paul... He can do it for anyone. Harry Ironside had this to say about grace. He said, grace is the very opposite of merit. Remember, we normally say grace is what? Unmerited favor, right? So it is the very opposite of merit. Grace is not only undeserved favor, but it is favor shown to the one who has deserved the very opposite. Amen? That's you and me. It reminds me of someone, this, uh, this man, you know, when he was a young boy, he was terribly abused by his father. He was not defended by his mother. And so in his very young mind, he said, there can be no God because God would never allow this to happen in my life. And so as he was growing up, he had a very clear and vehemently anti-God sentiment. He refused to believe in God. At the age of 12, he already became a, a part or a participant in the communist movement in the Philippines. Can you imagine? 12 years old, already active in the communist movement, clearly an atheistic, anti-God movement. When he became a college student, he became what they call a student agitator. And in the city where he was studying, he was single-handedly responsible for spearheading the largest school boycott in the history of that city. It paralyzed the universities. Five colleges and universities all walked out of their classroom in protest through the leadership of this guy. But one day, on his own Damascus Road, he met Jesus. And to compress his story, make the long story short, this guy is now one of the pastors of CCF. Can you imagine? That's the grace of God. A recipient of God's grace. Now, going back to all of us. What's one application that we can derive from what we just discussed? Let me ask you, how many of you have been touched and transformed by the grace of God? How many? Okay, look at all of these hands. I have an assignment for you. Okay? We want to know your story. So here is an invitation and a challenge. You may have seen the videos of these four individuals. Share God's amazing story in your life and let your testimony lead others to Christ. You know how to do a testimony, right? My life before Jesus, how I met Jesus, what Jesus is changing in my life, and then maybe a few more details. And I want you to take a picture of this QR code, and if you don't do it now, you can watch the video and take the picture there. 
because we want to know your story. You know why we want to know your story? Because other people need to hear your story. Don't ever, ever think, my story has no drama. Don't ever think that. The fact that the Lord reached out to you in love. Remember that song we sang earlier? Amazing love. Oh, what sacrifice the Son of God given for me. My debt he paid, my debt he died that I might live. And that same Jesus dwells in you and is transforming you every day of your life. Don't tell me your story has no drama. So folks, will we hear from you? Will you tell us your story? Nakpo. Porket nakamaskara, kala nyo, hindi ko naririnig. No, please, give God the glory. I'm not saying we will put all of you on video. I'm not saying we will have all of you stand here. But people need to know. And soon enough, you will see later on in the picture of the life of the Apostle Paul that this is part of our duty and our privilege on earth. So we said, first part of the picture of the full life is recipient of God's grace. Amen? Next, a minister of God's gospel. Look, notice everything is about God, not about us. A minister of God's gospel. Where do we see that in the life of Paul? Let's continue Romans 15. Verse 16 says, To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Now look, the word minister it's a servant who works for the benefit of the community. In other words, he doesn't think of himself. He works for the benefit of others. A priest is one who performs a sacred rite, a sacred duty. What does this mean today for you and me? Folks, it's as simple as this. The Bible says that we are priests. Yes? And when we share the gospel, it is ours. It is a sacred right. It is a sacred duty. It is a sacred privilege. Ministering to people. When he says ministering as a priest, the gospel of God. You know, what is the job of the priest in the Old Testament? The job of the priest in the Old Testament is two things. One is the priest will represent people to God. The second is, the, represent will rep the, the priest will represent God to people. Now, do you remember those three words? Pray, care, share. When we pray, when we intercede for people who don't know Jesus, we are representing them before God. When we pray with them, when we care for them, when we share our testimony with them, when we share the gospel with them, we are representing God to the people. Is that clear? Everybody gets that? Thumbs up? If that's clear, very good. You see, folks, this is an important component of the picture of the full life. We have no business being recipients of the grace of God if we will not share it with other people and tell them about it. That's why the second part of the picture of the full life is a minister of God's gospel. Now, <clears throat> what, what about this gospel? Why, why is it so important? Why is Paul so unashamed and so driven and so compelled? Well, look at what he said in 1 Corinthians 15. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, <clears throat> and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, as of first importance, it's like Paul is saying, you know, this is the most important message I could ever share. It is both urgent and important. And if you know that quadrant, you know, it's right there. Urgent and important. And he's saying it, it, it's the most important message I could ever share with anyone. The problem is, especially in a country like ours, this idea of Christ died for sins and buried and, and raised again, it's, it's something that many people know intellectually, right? They know it intellectually, 
but it's something that maybe their spiritual eyes remain closed to until the Holy Spirit makes a work in their life. And that's why we, to help open up their spiritual eyes, God uses many times your story and mine as we share uh, our testimony as well as the gospel. But this, this message is so important. Now, okay, I, I want to see... <laughs> uh, if you, I'm going to show you a picture again. If you know what this is, I want you to raise your hand right away. Okay, are you ready? Okay. Do you remember what this is? You raise your hand if you remember. Okay, I know your grandfather told you about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some people even had two of them, right? But I remember during the pager days of the world, when you had something really important for people to receive, you would tell the person on the other end of the line, please send it right away. Please send it twice. Because many times, you know, too late the hero, you know, when they receive the message. So please, send it right away, send it twice. And in Paul's mind, the gospel the most important message. But what is behind what Paul said? Christ uh, died, was buried, and was raised according to scriptures. You know, especially in this country, we need to dig a little deeper. We need to see what's behind that to see the heart of God. And in Philippians chapter 2, Paul uh, elucidates on that. He says, Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. In some versions, made himself nothing. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, uh, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What does this remind us of? You know, uh, this is part of what they call the humiliation of Christ. Uh, if Jesus went, came to earth and became the handsomest, richest, most powerful man on earth, it would have still been an incalculable, unthinkable humiliation. Because Jesus is God. There is no one like him. And yet, it says... He took on the appearance of a man in Isaiah. It says that he, there was nothing special about his appearance. He looked just like anybody else. We wouldn't even give him a second look. But more than that, when he suffered for you and me, it says his figure was marred. He was disfigured beyond recognition. Why? Because he didn't just become a man. He became a bond servant. And he became obedient to death, not a quick death, not a glorious death, but the gruesome, painful death on a cross. And that's why you and I are ministers of God's gospel. In the 1700s, Charles Wesley wrote a hymn. It's one of my favorites. It's one of the first I learned ever in CCF. Pastor Peter in the AIM days, one of my first hymns that I ever learned. And can it be that I should gain? And this is just one stanza. Okay, let me read it to you. I won't sing it this time. I'll just read it. I really want the words to sink in. He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all, immense and free, for, oh my God, it found out me. All together now, amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? And folks, that's why Peter writes. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. For what purpose? 
The only thing we can boast about is Jesus and His gospel. That you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. I was told about this, these two young girls. One of them uh, belonged to a religious group that said Jesus is only a man. You may have an idea what religious group that might be. Anyway, that was the belief of her family. But she became a follower of Jesus. She joined our youth movement in Elevate. Her dream was to have her parents hear the gospel. And you know, she did something simple, but she was very intentional. So she said to her classmates, can you come to the house so we can have dinner together and let's talk about the gospel so that my parents can hear it. This young lady is a minister of God's gospel. She knows. And then she had a friend, another young girl. This young girl wanted to share the gospel in her school. And so she said, oh, I have a class at 10 a.m. So I can go to the school early and look for somebody to share the gospel with. So she called the first young girl, the one I described earlier. So they went to the school at 7 in the morning. They went into the building from the first floor, the second floor, the third floor. They couldn't find people or maybe they weren't willing, willing to listen. On the fourth floor, they found somebody whose, God, whose heart God has prepared and they shared the gospel with that student and she gave her life to Jesus. Why all of that work? Well, apart from it being good exercise, going from the first to the fourth floor, because that one person is loved by Jesus. Because it says in the Gospel of Luke, even for one sinner who repents, there is what? Rejoicing among the angels in heaven. So folks, you and I, we are ministers of God's gospel. So is the picture becoming clearer? The picture of the full life. Okay, so let's check again. A picture of the full life. Number one, recipient of God's grace. But we don't keep it to ourselves. Number two component of the picture, a minister of God's gospel. You may not feel like a minister. You may not look like a minister, but you are. Because God says so. Number three, an instrument of God's power. Oh, let's go back to the life of the Apostle Paul. And how was that true for him? Romans 15, verse 17, he says, Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. Not about me, but about him. For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed. Remember, you know, Paul is recalling the sovereignty of God, how the gospel and Messiah were rejected vehemently by the Jews when he tried to share it with them, but that was the wide open door for the gospel to reach the Gentiles, and as we said earlier, and that's why you and I are here today. But what was Paul talking about when he said, what Christ has accomplished through me. Well, he goes on to say, in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and round about as far as Illyricum, which is estimated something like 1,400 miles, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. You know, Paul could not have done this without the power of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, many commentators estimate that he traveled a total of 10,000 miles throughout his journey, only by the power of the Holy Spirit. Then he goes on, and thus I aspired to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, and this is an Old uh, Testament quotation, they the Gentiles, who had no news of him, shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. Such was the passion of the Apostle Paul. He wanted to make sure that he wasn't um, duplicating other people's efforts. He really wanted to take the gospel 
to places where it had never been heard of before. Why? Because that was Jesus' marching orders for him. Now, this thing about signs and wonders, power of the Holy Spirit, wh where do we see that? As an example, in the book of Acts, Paul said, uh, not Paul said, but the, the book of Acts said, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out. Isn't that amazing? By the way, you be careful. When you see on television somebody saying, oh, we have this divine hunger chief, you know, only $10, only 1,000 pesos, and if you buy this hunger chief from me and put it on the sick person, he will be well. Please, don't be fooled. But we're talking about a very specific manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Apostle Paul. Now, you might be saying, will God do the same things through me? I'm not saying He won't. But we're not just talking about, you know, uh, evil spirits being cast out or sick people being healed. The application for us today, ladies and gentlemen, is called the Spirit-filled life. You and I need to operate day by day moment by moment, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul writes in Ephesians 5.18, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because this is what the Holy Spirit does in Galatians chapter 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, you know, if you stop there, parang sobra-sobra na, no? It's like, wow, Lord, love, joy, peace. I mean, where can you find that in this world? But wait, there's more. <laughs> Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So, folks, you and I are meant to be living the full life as instruments of God's power. I was told about another young girl, and at that time, you know, she was sharing the gospel, doing Bible study with her classmates in school, but she, she felt the conviction. She said, you know what, I, I should be doing this more with my family. And that's why, you know, in the last many years, we've been reminded that our family is our first ministry. But of course, she's like the young person in the family. So how, can I, how could I possibly influence my family to get to know the Jesus that I know? And, you know, her, her father was, uh, at that time, he was drinking and womanizing. And the family was even against her coming to, to CCF. Uh, and every, even when she would try to invite them, they'd uh, refuse. But, you know, God eventually used the life of this young girl. Not just her, you know, talking about the gospel, which is important, but her life, her transformed life. Because as they observed her more and more as she grew in her relationship with Jesus, she was becoming more and more obedient. Her character was changing. There was a time that she was in a relationship, not necessarily a bad one, but for some reason the family didn't like it. And when they told her that they were not exactly, uh, you know, crazy about her relationship, immediately, no arguments, she cut the relationship. And so their jaws dropped. And they said, what is happening to our little girl? In, an, in a good way. To make the long story short, after months of praying, after months of living the Spirit-filled life, being a good example, the family agreed to attend CCF. The father, who used to be a drunkard, was transformed 180 degrees. No more drinking, no more cheating on the wife. Two years later, the mother and the other daughter were transformed. Today, this family is solid in Jesus. Their relationships are like this. They study the Bible together. Amazing. Why? Because this young girl realized she can be an instrument of the power of God. 
So that's the third component that we see in the picture of the full life. Now, let me show you this quotation from Chip Ingram. Okay? Now, the quotation, it, says, it should say, come to IDC, I want to see you there. <laughs> no, but the quotation is this. God specializes in using ordinary people to do extraordinary things for the glory of God. Never underestimate what God can do with a person whose life is fully surrendered to Him and lives according to the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Recipient of God's grace, minister of God's gospel, instrument of God's power, servant of God's people. That's the last. Do you recognize this man? You recognize him? Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of... Do you know what was his job before he became the president of Ukraine? He was a comedian. And in a, an amazing irony, in the comedy series that he was in, he was a, a, a school teacher who became the president of Ukraine in the, te in the comedy. But you know what they say, sometimes life imitates art. And so he ended up becoming the real president of Ukraine. And now he's facing challenges that are beyond his imagination. But you know what? Something like that happened to the Apostle Paul. His life is an irony of God's grace because he went from being a, a religious, uh, arrogant, you know, ze zealous person who believed so much in himself and his cause to a servant going about so, so many parts of the world serving God, serving people, even if it meant not just his discomfort, but even if it meant his very life. Here in chapter, oh, sorry, verse 22, he says, For this reason I have often been prevented from coming to you, but now with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. What, what is Paul saying? Basically, aside from going around and preaching the gospel, the Apostle Paul would go to the Christians in many places. Why? You know, spend money. He was supporting himself, basically, most of the time. And just to encourage them. Because there's no Viber, right? There's not, not even, what do you call that? Bicycle, the thing we showed earlier. Nothing. He had to go by himself. Of course, he could write a letter, but it would take ages, right? And he wanted to, to see them face to face. But now, he said, he said to the Christians in Rome, Malapit na. I'm, 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 the time for me to see you is near. But for now, he says, but now I am going to Jerusalem serving the saints. Why? What was Paul going to do? What was so important? He said, Macedonia and Achaia, these are Gentile churches, have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. What a wonderful picture of unity in the body of Christ. Here you have the Gentile Christians putting money together, giving it to Paul, who will bring it to Jews who became believers in Jerusalem. It's, and that's why he says, yes, they were pleased to do so, and they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, remember the gospel, to the Jews first and then to the Gentile, they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. Therefore, when I have finished this, meaning this errand, and have put my seal on this fruit of theirs, I will go on by way of you to Spain. So what is Paul saying? I'll see you soon enough in God's time, but right now, I am a messenger. I'm a messenger with a very precious gift. And you know, transporting a gift like that can be very, very dangerous as well. But such was the Apostle Paul, a servant of God's people. Now, to give us a present-day picture of what the full life looks like, with all of these components, our brother Adrian. Adrian, will you come forward, please? Let's welcome our brother Adrian from CCF North EDSA. 
he will tell us his story about, well, how God is um, completing this picture of the full life with him. As a, as a second son amongst four boys, I grew up having insecurities, so I constantly sought for attention and acceptance from others by becoming competitive in all my endeavors. I wanted to prove to everyone, especially to my parents, that I was the best. If, I did not, if anyone did not give me the recognition, recognition I felt I needed, I would easily harbor bitterness and unforgiveness towards them. Because of my desire to have complete autonomy of my life, I grabbed the opportunity to take my intermediate and high school education in Canada away from parental supervision. It was there where I learned how to drink and smoke at 13 and started having casual sex at 15. This led to my downward spiral into immorality and impurity. Despite my worldly lifestyle, I still considered myself a good person who did not need God in his life. I carried my self-confidence through college and managed to establish a construction business with my friends. The success was great, but how I was handling it only heightened my misbehaviors. My routine consisted of getting drunk, womanizing, and discrediting the Bible. I looked down on anyone who went against my life views and my way of living. This lifestyle continued until I was professionally working, and by this time I was already married to my wife, Trisha, who had been sharing to me about Jesus Christ. I started as a Sunday Christian, attending church on Sundays, yet for the rest of the week I was still the same drunkard and adulterer. Just when things were going well, our construction business went bankrupt, leaving us, leaving us with more than 70 million pesos in debt. What's worse, rumors about me stealing spread, being the CFO of the company. My world literally crumbled. It made me reflect. My wife resented me. I had a one-year-old daughter who I barely spent time with. I had no more income, no fallback. I was a thief in the eyes of many with millions of pesos in debt. I was at my lowest point. I was totally helpless, hopeless, and powerless. This was when my wife's sister told us about CCF. I remember how my tears flowed uncontrollably every Sunday worship because I was seeking refuge in the Lord. However, there were still remnants of disobedience. As a result of my half-heartedness, I continued to make poor family decisions which affected my loved ones. Finally, one morning service in January 2008, as I heard the gospel being shared once again, I was humbled by his unceasing grace. This time, I completely understood Jesus Christ's death and resurrection for sinners like me. So right then and there, I gave my whole to him. I even gave my lighter and cigarettes to Trisha right after the service because I got tired of playing games with myself, everyone, and especially with God. Soon, I began to read the Bible on my own and look forward to praying and communing with God. I stopped wallowing in the past and started letting God define me. The Lord opened my eyes to appreciating my wife more, for she suffered the most from my wayward and disobedient living. Trisha, I love you. Thank you for being so patient with me. Even though we were still in the wilderness of paying our debts using our car and some of my wife's pieces of jewelry, God never failed to provide for our needs. There were times I didn't want to pay our creditors faithfully, but the Lord spoke to me through Psalm 37. It says, the wicked borrows and does not pay back. Having been convinced by the word of God, I was slowly paying my debts with enthusiasm. Little did I know that God was also stirring up the hearts of some creditors to write off our debts. And by God's grace, my last check payment cleared in 2017, so we are now officially debt-free. Praise God. God's grace and faithfulness encouraged us to further depend on God who does not disappoint. Soon, my long desire for my family to have our own house happened miraculously. Not only was our new home given to us for free, but some family members and even the seller of the house helped with our renovation expenses. We saw more of God's grace and sovereignty when I, heard, when I learned my daughter had to go through a major spine surgery in 2020. I knew that the Lord was in control, but I still doubted Him. I was asking him, why us? We serve you diligently. Why can't it be someone else who can afford such a surgery? The Lord graciously answered through our discipleship group, where both leader and co-members were praying for my family and gently rebuking me for blaming the Lord. Despite my shortcomings, God made my daughter's surgery successful, even making her recovery quick. 
On top of that, the expenses incurred in the surgery were all paid for. Praise God. From a Bible skeptic who would spread false truths, now a defender of the faith who teaches GLC, God truly gives grace and empowers his servants. From a passive Sunday churchgoer to someone actively serving in a family ministry of CCF North EDSA and leading several small groups, I became a minister of the gospel because of the Lord. But the Lord is not done with me yet. I am Adrian Camacho, once always fooling around, but now living a full life for the kingdom of God. All glory and honor to our living Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise God indeed, Adrian. Give us the privilege of praying for you. Will you raise your right hand of blessing towards her brother, Adrian? Father God, we thank you so much for giving us this morning so many pictures of what the full life looks like, not the least of which is the picture you're painting in the life of our brother, Adrian. Keep him and Trisha and their wonderful family always in the center of your will, in the palm of your hands. Keep them safe. Let, them, let their lives blossom for your glory from one day to the next. And thank you again for his life. May he and his whole family and generations after him be faithful to you until the day we all see you together in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, brother. What a blessing. Okay. So, we all know what a life, a full life looks like. But if you transition into chapter 16 of Romans, you will realize there are so many names. It's like a list of, you know, it's almost like the book of Numbers. But when you think about it, all of these people represent a picture of the full life. For example, what does Paul say there? He says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, by the way, her name is Bright or Radiant. It's a beautiful name who is a servant of the church which is at Sincrea, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever man matter she may have need of you, for she herself has also been a helper of many and of myself as well. We don't know much about this, young, this lady, young or old, we don't know, married or single, but we know that she went through all of these things, a sinner saved by grace and so forth, and we will see her in heaven. But all we know is that she is a servant, and she is a saint, and, she, and that means that she was chosen by the sovereignty of God. And then Paul, Paul goes on to say, greet Prissa, which means greatly esteemed, and Aquila, which means eagle, my fellow workers, because they were in the same business, tent making. And also, of course, they were fellow workers in terms of the gospel. In Christ Jesus, who for my life risked their own necks to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. In other words, if it were not for these, these two, Paul would have you know, died prematurely in human terms, and the work of the gospel would have been der derailed. Also greet the church that is in their house. Oh, so these guys are also leading a D group in their own home or a house fellowship. So we know that these guys are also, uh, their lives are also a portrait of uh, the grace of God, the full life. And then it says, greet, greet Epinetus, which means praised or commendable, my beloved, who is the first convert to Christ from Asia. All of these people have their special story. Even this man named Epinetus, who was the first convert, most likely in Achaia, and most likely through God's ministry, through Prisa and Aquila. So all of these names are, are portraits or pictures of the full life. Now, we won't go through every single name that you'll see in the 16th chapter of Romans, but if you go through verse 6 to 16, you have all of these amazing names. These are real people. These are living epistles. Some of them are not even named because it says the household of so-and-so and his mother, but they're real people. We will see them in heaven. We will hear their stories personally when we are gathered together with Jesus. But all of them without exception, uh, high and low estate, men and women, young and old, possibly master and slave, all of them are pictures of the full life. And if you'd like to name some of your future children after some of these, uh, have your pick, Philologus, Asyncritus, Aristobulus, it's up to you. Now, skipping over 
uh, this, this list of names whose lives are each a picture of the full life. The Apostle Paul also says, wait a minute, there are people with me who are greeting those people. See, the, the names we saw earlier, he says, greet all of these people in my name, greet them, greet them, give them my regards and so forth, give them my love. And then he's saying, there are people with me who also are greeting them. Let them know. Who are these people? Well, these are, these are the names uh, that are mentioned in verses 21 to 23. Let me just pick out a few just to show us the significance that all of these people are a picture of the full life. Timothy, we know who that is. The young protege of the Apostle Paul who eventually became the pastor at Ephesus and to whom he wrote, obviously, the letters addressed to Timothy. And then there's this guy, Tertius. Who was Tertius? Tertius was the secretary of Paul writing the book of Romans. I mean, just think about it. Here is this guy named Tertius minding his own business, not even knowing who Jesus was. And one day, and we don't know exactly how it happened, but someday we will know. The Holy Spirit opens his eyes. He gives his life to Jesus. He's now ministering with Paul. And he's the one taking down the dictation of the book of Romans. And that's why we have the book of Romans today. Is that amazing or what? I mean, that's how God works through people, using ordinary people in extraordinary ways. And here we have Erastus. Now, who is that? Well, he's described in the book of Romans as the city treasurer, a government official. How many of you here work for the government in some way, shape, or form? You work for the government, yeah? We praise God for you because he has raised you up to be a blessing in the public sector. Now, how many of you work in the private sector? Okay, uh, what do the rest of you do? Uh, no, anyway, <laughs> wherever God has placed you, Wherever God has placed you, He has placed you there to live the full life in full view of everybody else. Not to bring glory to ourselves, but to point people to the one who said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. But just before we end, the Apostle Paul inserts a warning. He inserts a warning about something that can shatter this picture. What is that? He says in verses 17 and 18 of Romans 16, Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause what? Dissensions and hindrances, contrary to the teaching which you learn, and turn away from them. He, did just, he didn't just say watch out for them. He says turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. What is he warning us against? The word dissension means separates people into pointless factions. In other words, there will be people in the church who will cause people to have useless debates. Just like what Pastor Peter was talking about, non-essentials. So that the church of Christ is polarized over something that shouldn't even be a topic of debate. And what happens then? The loser is the rest of the world. Because they need to hear the gospel rather than listen to Christians bickering. You know what I'm saying? And then hindrances means bait. It's like, you know, when you have a mousetrap and you put cheese or peanut or banana or something. It's bait for a trap. It draws one to sin or disobedience. Paul is saying, watch out and turn away from this, these people. Then he goes on to say, for the report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you. But, he says, I want you to be wise or to be excellent in what is good and innocent in what is evil. That is Paul's message to us here today as we continue to live the full life. Be wise in what is good, but be innocent of evil. And all of these things that are coming against the church of Jesus, whether from the inside or from the outside, Paul declares in verse 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. As a fulfillment of God's prophecy in Genesis chapter 3, 
He says, the grace of our Lord be with you. And so we end chapter 16 with Paul's amazing doxology. Look at what he said. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God has been made known to all the nations leading to obedience of faith. What did he say at the end? To the only wise God. Through Jesus Christ be the glory forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, remember we said the whole book of Romans is a picture of the full life. Right? Let's look at this doxology once more. Look, he's talking about here the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past. He's talking about the gospel, right? And the gospel is what tells us we are sinners. It's the gospel that tells us we need salvation. Remember, these are the two first components of the book of Romans. And then he says, but now it's manifested by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandments of the eternal God. The commandments of the word of God is what sanctifies us. It's in, when we obey them, we become more like Jesus. And so that points to our continuing sanctification. And then he says, has been made known not only to the Jews, but to all of the nations. That is the sovereignty of God. And finally, leading to obedience, service, offering our bodies as living sacrifices. The obedience of faith, that is service. And that's why, folks, the whole book of Romans is a picture of the full life. And that's why at the end, Paul says, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. And so we end, as we began, with an empty frame. What is the picture of your life? Is it the full life or is it the full life? Shall we bow our heads in prayer? If you're living the full life and you know it's all because of the grace of God, take a moment to thank Him and just continue to commit your life to Him and say, yes, Lord, I will live the full life. I, I am a recipient of your grace. I will be a minister of your gospel. I will be an instrument of your power and I will be a servant of your people. But if you're here today, you're listening, you're watching, you're physically present or otherwise, and you know you are living your own life, but not the full life Jesus intended for you. Well, the sovereignty of God. He has you exactly where He wants you. But still, you need to make the choice. You need to open your heart to Him and say, yeah, why don't you do that? Say it. Open your heart and tell Him, Lord Jesus, I need you. I'm a sinner. I need your salvation. I, there is no hope for me apart from you. I open my heart. I give you my life in all humility and sincerity and I choose to live your full life in me rather than my foolish life with myself. And so, Lord, I give you my life. Here I am. But make me into that person that you designed me to be. Be my God, my Lord, my Savior, my Messiah, my Master, my everything, the reason why I live and the reason why I know I will be with you in heaven someday. Thank you, Jesus because you lived the full life and now I can live it because of you. I give you all glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.
Good day, CCF fam. I'm Aika Makazo from CCF Communications, and with me is one of our dearest pastors, Pastor Ricky Sarthu, to answer some of our questions for Sunday Fast Track. Pastor Ricky, praise God for your message today. So sure. let's get into it. Sure. So the first question is, the full life starts with being a recipient of God's grace, you know, mm -hmm. accepting Him as our Lord and Savior. But what about those who already have a relationship with the Lord, but maybe lost motivation along the way or got burnt out? As one of our commenters from TikTok put it, how can we restart our relationship with God? That's a very significant question because I'm sure it's not only that TikToker who has that question in his or her mind. Um, you know, in the book of Revelation, Jesus has a message to one of the churches where he says, repent and do the things you did at first. So I would suggest that you go back to that day when you first met Jesus and review the circumstances under which that amazing encounter happened because those things are are precious they're they're divine and they're supernatural and they are the turning point in your life and so if you revisit your former way of life and and reappreciate the grace of god in your life i would think that would be an excellent way of restarting your faith and if i were you if you haven't done this yet you put it down on paper so that you, as you write god's story in your life no matter how short uh, that narration may be I'm sure it will bring back into your mind and your heart and your spirit just the amazing grace of God in your life. But my next assignment or suggestion to you is since you will have already have written up your story, tell somebody else about it. Another thing is if you are not accountable to anyone, nobody's mentoring or discipling you, I would strongly suggest that you join a small group or at least uh, have some mature, relatively mature Christian mentor and disciple you so that he can help move you along your spiritual journey as well right that's great it's kind of like preaching the gospel to yourself right that's right yeah. speaking of that how do we know we're the right person to minister god's gospel and where can we start how do i know i'm the right person to minister god's gospel it's very simple if you have heard understood and believed in the gospel you are the right person to share it. I mean, it's like your parents gave you your name and now you can write your name on your school test paper. It's as simple as that. Now, there's no way that you would have been saved today if you are a true follower of Jesus had you not understood the gospel. And you know that the gospel is simple and extremely powerful. So I, I think it's really more an attitude thing and the closer we move our attitude towards that of Paul who said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because I'm so convinced that the gospel is the power for salvation to people who believe, then my friend, you are the right person right now. If you believe in Jesus, you are the right person to be God's minister of the gospel. Praise God. Now for our third question, you mentioned in your message that in order to be an effective witness for Jesus, the secret is to have a spirit-filled or transformed life. Mm. Now what if I have a simple testimony or I've known Jesus my whole life? How can I relate the gospel to others if my own story isn't so relatable? Okay, I guess people ask that question because they hear a lot of dramatic turnarounds, you know, 180 degrees, a black to white kind of thing. But let me tell you, every story written by God in anyone's life who has come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior is an amazing story. It's a supernatural knock-your-socks-off story. No matter how simple or ordinary you think your testimony may be. Uh, for example, someone may say, I've been a good person all my life. I was never a drunkard into drunk, uh, drugs or anything like that. And then I just came to know Jesus and here I am today. You know, do you realize it takes a lot of faith for a good religious person to believe that he needs a savior? That's what happened with the Apostle Paul. So my friend, the Bible says you are God's workmanship. It means you are a masterpiece. You are not some ordinary object that you just put in a corner and people will ignore. Your life is a masterpiece of God's work and people need to know how he fashioned you that way. Right, and you know, they'll never know unless they try. Of course. <laughs> In your message, you also mentioned serving. So CCF yeah. has many ministries equipped with 
people. So where can we begin to serve when there are already people serving? Oh, the work of God's kingdom on earth will always need more people to get it done. God will get it done with or without us, but the privilege is ours to be a part of it. Now, a person may be thinking, oh, there's so many people already, you know, like ushering or whatever, or playing music, singing. But the mission, the core mission God has for his people is to disciple them. There will always be room for one more disciple maker in this world. For example, if I'm speaking now to a member of a small group and you are not yet leading your own small group, that is the best way you can begin to serve. And if your family members, say if you're living with them or even if you're not, because we have all kinds of technology anyway, if your family doesn't know Jesus, the best way to serve is to help them know Jesus and help them start and move along in their spiritual journey. There will always be vacancies, always be needs for people who are willing and able to serve God. No question about it. That's really motivating to go out, serve, write our testimony, share the gospel. So thank you, Pastor Ricky, for answering our questions. And that's it for Sunday Fast Track.